And on Tuesday, so it's time for the history of the world to begin. <laughs> the uh, this course is one that I haven't taught before, and to the best of my knowledge, no one else at Columbia has taught it before, uh, because world history has generally been regarded as a subject that either cannot or should be taught at elite universities. It, um, it has been a very uh, unusual area of history in that instead of deriving from the thought and writings of uh, famous historians, it has emerged uh, from the ground up, from uh, essentially it's a demand side course that comes out of the K through 12 uh, educational system. And I need to tell you a little bit about how that occurred in order for you to understand how I will approach this course. During the 60s and the 70s, uh, you all know enough about history to know that we had uh, a, a profoundly transforming civil rights movement uh, accompanied and even more followed by a feminist movement along with a very strong uh, increased awareness of the role of Native Americans and immigrant groups from non-European backgrounds. <clears throat> And the result of this educationally was that in the, uh, in the school systems, uh, uh, both college but even more pre-college, it became understood that American history should be taught as a history that embodies, that embodies diversity. Uh, now, uh, that provoked a certain uh, opposition of people who said that multiculturalism is uh, somehow a betrayal of American uh, uh, values and, uh, and principles. But by and large, a multicultural uh, or diversity-oriented uh, narrative of American history became uh, the standard in the American school systems. Uh, to a lesser degree in other parts of the world, to a much lesser degree. The, the problem was that if you went back and taught American history this way, how far back could you go? You could go back to 1776. Uh, you could go back and maybe do a century of colonial American history. Um, but there's a problem that if you wanted to get the earlier take on history that would uh, meld with the new ways of teaching American history, you were going to have to have a narrative that uh, manifested the same degree of diversity or of, um, say, cultural relativism or at least appreciation of different cultures that you had for the new American history courses. And yet the way history was taught is that Western Civ was the broad context within which American history was placed. And Western Civ was a narrative uh, constructed in a very, in a somewhat artificial fashion, starting from Egypt to Mesopotamia, migrating to Greece, migrating to Europe, forgetting, Ethiopia, uh, forgetting Egypt and Mesopotamia and Greece. Uh, becoming the Roman Empire, becoming the, the Dark Ages, becoming the Renaissance, the Reformation, the early modern period, Industrial Revolution, and us. So you had a, uh, a master narrative of, the, of how Europe got to be Europe that was just fine as a preamble for American history, so long as the only Americans you were interested in teaching were uh, white Americans of European background. 
So now you had a problem that you had a uh, you had a history that was uh, developing for uh, for American history courses in a diverse fashion, uh, coming on top of a broader history that was Eurocentric uh, and Euro well not exclusively Eurocentric because Egypt and Mesopotamia are not in Europe, but we forget about Egypt and Mesopotamia once we get the Greeks revved up and going. So we had a Eurocentric history that didn't match uh, the American history. So the result was that uh, various educators uh, in various states started to agitate for global awareness or global studies. And in the course of time, you know, 20 or 30 states mandated that global studies of some sort be taught so that there was some kind of a, uh, of a linkage between the way American history was being rethought and the way history broadly was thought. This job went initially to social studies teachers who had been around for several generations, usually taught in elementary schools, uh, and now they were charged with global studies and then a problem developed because social studies teachers tended to have a chronological depth of about 10 years. And so they couldn't do that part of history that would dovetail with the early stages of American history. So a, a, a sort of a coup came about in the 1980s in which high school history teachers uh, fought with and succeeded in grasping from the social studies teaching network the teaching of world history. Uh, now these history teachers were teachers of American history and of Western Civ. None of them had ever taken world history. But it was a kind of a turf war. They said, we're historians, we deal with the past. You want to do the past differently, you go through us. You don't go hire somebody else. No, we do the history. And so they, they kicked the social studies teachers out. I may be exaggerating. Um, and now it became the job of uh, history teachers, particularly in high school, to, uh, to uh, carry out the state mandates for global awareness, global studies, and so forth. Now the problem was that none of the people who were now going to teach world history had ever taken world history because world history wasn't taught in American universities. Um, I remember in the 90s uh, going to uh, you know, seminars on how to teach world history in which you might have 100 high school teachers. And if you took a show of hands, you know, how many of you are teaching world history? And they'd all raise their hand and say, how many of you have taken world history? And no one would raise their hand. Uh, and this was a terrible problem because you had people who had no qualifications to teach world history who were now teaching it by mandate and they were uh, struggling, uh, to, to say the least. And we're talking about 10,000 plus teachers nationwide who had to do this in addition to coaching the soccer team or whatever else they were expected to do. Uh, this was seen as a crisis by certain organizations. The college board uh, brought together a, um, uh, a workshop of senior historians and high school teachers to talk about how to do it. Uh, the uh, National Council for the Humanities funded a project to create a master outline for world history uh, involving, uh, I think, eight uh, senior professors of history, none of whom either taught or had studied world history. Uh, the meetings of the committee were essentially um, turf wars. You know, we need more in China. No, no, we need more in India and so forth. We never would have finished the job if our professor of Japanese history had not been absent on the last day because she was not going to give up any turf to the rest of us. 
Uh, so you had national standards for world history. You had a report by the college board. Uh, you had the Educational Testing Service, which is an offshoot of the College Board, uh, created an AP exam in world history. And the AP exam had uh, a division, a chronological division, it said, here is how world history should be taught. Um, the AP exam had a, a, a massive impact. The rap, most rapidly growing field for AP examination that the uh, educational testing service had ever known. You know, thousands upon thousands of students were taking world history in 10th grade, taking the, uh, the advanced placement exam in 11th grade, and, um, and then blowing off their senior year and then going to college. Uh, this was a uh, profound challenge uh, for the textbook industry, which quite openly did not pay any attention whatsoever to what any of these uh, well-intentioned uh, committees were trying to do. The textbook industry uh, had a huge investment in uh, producing uh, Western Civ textbooks. And now their market was being challenged. So what they did initially was to take a Western Civ book and pay somebody to write an additional chapter in India, a chapter in China, a chapter in Africa, a chapter on something else. And so you got uh, not Western Civ light, but Western Civ heavy, uh, where you took your, the, the same narrative you had and you added these things to it. And it really worked well as a reinforcement of imperialism to show that Europe always was and always will be the center and other parts of the world are peripheral uh, areas uh, to, uh, to Europe. And it became very clear that, that the augmented Western Civ approach uh, was going to be a failure. Uh, too much Western Civ. And indeed, the project of world history became pretty explicitly defined uh, by the end of the 80s as a project of, provincial, of provincializing Europe and provincializing the United States. Now, they could do it, they could provincialize the United States, that is to say, write a world history in which the United States plays very little role because they knew that there was another course entirely on American history and therefore nobody could criticize them for, for soft peddling the American side of it. But provincializing Europe was a huge problem. Universities, <coughs> like this one and most others, um, <coughs> that gave PhD degrees, had history departments that were divided into American historians, uh, frequently a majority, uh, or if in the South, Civil War historians, and they'd be a majority, uh, but American historians, uh, European historians, and other or what we call here at Columbia, we say we have the Americanists, Europeanists, and the world. <laughs> and the world group was often thought of as being a, the parallel of the Americanists and the Europeanists, except a little bit smaller, because they just had to cover uh, Asia, Africa, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so they were, you know, the, the investment in Western Civ was colossal. Uh, professorships, uh, scholarship of every variety, publishing companies. Um, you could not abandon Western Civ without, uh, without a fight. Uh, over time, uh, Eurocentrism as a bugaboo was joined by Sinocentrism because the Chinese historians had a record of uh, archival resources and documents and scholarly effort and so forth that made them say, okay, let's do the world the way it should be, namely Europe and China. And so you ended up with the idea that uh, world historians should be uh, 
should avoid Eurocentrism and avoid Sinocentrism, uh, or indeed avoid any centrism. And that is the reason that uh, I maintain that, that this course, which is our first on world history, will be eccentric. Uh, it's also built into the fact that uh, this is my last year teaching before retirement, and I can say anything I damn well please <laughs> uh, with no consequences, you know, and no regrets. So, you know, some of you will look back and say, he said it was going to be eccentric, but he didn't say it was going to be all bullshit. Uh, but, you know, you'll find out. The, uh, so, so th this was an interesting case. You had uh, world history being taught in the schools, and then you had uh, sort of second and third tier public uh, colleges, you know, state universities, uh, community colleges, who felt we have to teach the high school teachers who teach world history. So they started to offer world history so that their graduates could have some background when they went and got a job teaching high school. Well, it turned out their professors had no background in world history. So then there was a thought, well, maybe the universities that produce PhDs should teach people to teach uh, people to teach world history. And very gradually, world history has gone from being in the schools and worked its way up to being uh, now uh, at Columbia. I don't think Harvard teaches this. I'm pretty sure Princeton doesn't. Um, but, uh, and it may, they may not do it after this year, who knows. But it's a, uh, it, it's a fascinating example of the way in which history is built uh, not on just intellectual uh, achievement or vision, but also on matters of politics and ideology. This is a course at, uh, that is heavily uh, rooted in issues of politics and ideology. Every year uh, in the summer, this, this past year was in Fort Collins, Colorado, hundreds of teachers gather for a week or two to grade the AP exams. This year was 870 high school teachers uh, flew out to Colorado, and I think they had to do several, grade several hundred exams apiece. And uh, a close friend of mine, I, I know, I've known people who've done it, I haven't done it, never will. Um, but uh, my friend said, you know, it was like a cult. These people live world history. Uh, they look down on other forms of history. World history is, is what it is. And yet, there's no real clarity as to what world history actually is. Uh, so to some degree, it's an ideology. If you had to define it as an ideology or as a philosophy, uh, in my view, what I'd say is that world history, in the way that it is being thought of by people who identify themselves as world historians, uh, members of the World History Association, which unlike other academic associations is about 50% high school teachers and 50% college professors, um, what they are doing they might define as the antidote to the Columbia Core curriculum. Now, for the last 80 years or so, we have had a core curriculum at Columbia that has uh, assumed a certain quasi-divine quality for the Western civilization uh, accomplishment at its highest level. And we, uh, we teach that in CC and Lit Hum, Art Hum, Music Hum. Um, all of these are worthy courses. Um, I have no objection to the Columbia core curriculum. Uh, in fact, I'm the only member of the faculty who's actually taught all four of those courses. Uh, and yet, there is no way that you can tweak the Columbia core curriculum to include the rest of the world. You cannot say, oh, this year we're going to include Ibn Khaldun or you know, a passage from Mencius or Gilgamesh, and therefore we have the whole world covered because your standard 
of comparison remains the Western Civ core. Beyond that, the structure of the Columbia Core curriculum assumes that the proper way to study uh, cultures over time is through uh, literary texts or artistic uh, monuments of one sort or another. In other words, they, uh, the core curriculum is strongly biased against um, popular uh, history, social history, economic history, quantitative history, all of these areas that do not depend upon uh, the great works. Uh, we have the, the conceit that, uh, that there's a sort of conversation among all the great thinkers that, you know, you can sit in class and imagine, well, what would St. Augustine say to Martin Luther or John Rawls or something like that? That's total baloney, but it's, um, it's the conceit that keeps the thing going, that you, you imagine that this is a great uh, conversation. Uh, world history tends to avoid the, the peaks of high culture, um, both because they're trying to uh, decenter uh, the narrative and get it away from Europe, uh, and because the problem with any uh, high cultural text is that in an American school system, people are always looking for the European analog. You know, what is the Bhagavad Gita like in Western history? Uh, what are the analog analects of Confucius like, and so forth? So the World historians tend to use different principles uh, than the people who, uh, who designed and uh, you know, devoted their careers to things like the Columbia Core Curriculum. Uh, nowadays, we have a lot of debate over the Core Curriculum about how to and whether to uh, tweak it to be international. And my own view is that that cannot work and that you have to actually uh, move out of that house and moved into, into another one. Maybe that one's made of bricks and this one's made of twigs. Nevertheless, we're moving with the piggies into a different house in a course like this. So what do we do uh, in a course like this? Well, in the first place, there are three different levels at which you can think about world history. And to some degree, I want to use this course to, uh, to uh, introduce all three. Uh, the first is as a narrative. Uh, when you finish this course, particularly if you take both semesters, you will know everything that happened of importance in the entire history of the world. And, uh, you know, you might as well drop out of college after that because what more is there to know? Um, actually, that won't happen. The problem is that the narrative is a colossal grand compromise that comes out of the whole history of uh, curriculum design uh, combined with the interests of textbook publishers. What distinguished world history from American history was that everyone could assume that a high school teacher teaching American history actually knew something about American history before the course began and could read a textbook and sort of understand it and augment it through their own additional reading and experience. The opposite assumption was the true in world history. The assumption was that uh, the teacher knows nothing and everything must be in the textbook. Um, this put enormous power in the hands of the textbook publishers. And the textbook publishers uh, have progressively abandoned the Western Civ augmented approach and adopted a sort of a pan-global uh, perspective that tries to give balance to all parts and all periods. Uh, this has not been wildly successful uh, educationally, but it is phenomenally successful if you're lucky enough to be an author. 
I happen to be lucky enough to be an author. And uh, it has allowed me to, uh, to lead a life over the last 10 years or so very different from what my Columbia salary would have permitted. Um, because the teachers are so dependent on the textbooks that if you have a successful textbook, you, you sell many, many thousands of, of units. Uh, and um, you fight off your competition, you struggle for market share, and so forth and so on. Uh, very tedious, but fortunately very lucrative. Um, and one of the things that you discover is that when you write this narrative, you're not writing history in the way you would if you were writing a monograph on, say, the climate history of Iran in the, in the 11th century, which is what my most recent monographic work has been on. Uh, nobody expects you to have anything new. Uh, they expect you to be um, artful in putting together things that are generally agreed upon and broadly known. In the textbook race, the victory goes to the fastest horse, not to the fastest animal. You cannot enter a textbook that looks like a cheetah because uh, you will be seen as cheating. And um, it has to look like a horse and smell like a horse and run like a horse in order to be accepted. So the result is that all the publishers read each other's publications, sample the views of adopters and potential adopters, and they gradually uh, focus in on certain ways of doing it. The result is that even though this field is less than 20 years old uh, in the way I'm describing it, uh, it's become um, prematurely uh, ossified. You know, the books all say more or less the same thing. Um, but what they're saying really isn't any more world history than uh, in, it's, it's a it's a new construction of history that is not the old Eurocentric history, but it isn't really a world history uh, in the way that a world history might be done by people who are more adventurous. And yet, this is the way we teach it. This is the way the Educational Testing Service designs the exam. That is the way we, I, uh, I'm going to have the readings in this, in this course. For this semester, um, we're going to read this book. This is volume one of The Earth and Its Peoples, authored by me and several colleagues. Uh, this is my effort to profiteer off the class. And we will read one chapter a week. This is the way it's designed uh, for the 14 weeks of the semester. I do not expect you to learn any of the material contained in the book. Uh, the exams will not ask you for any factual material. Uh, I don't expect you to memorize anything in the book. Uh, I'm going to be asking you to do something that is much harder. That is say, think about what's in the book. And be prepared on papers and exams to, to, to raise questions, to deconstruct it, to, uh, to suggest ways in which it's, you know, it's ridiculous. Um, the model for how to demonstrate the ridiculousness of it will be my lectures. In other words, the lectures for this course will be a second level of history. Let's say we'll have a, a, a narrative contained in a book, and then we'll have a course of lectures that is kibitzing the book. I know every debate that has gone into this book. I have been the principal or author or a editorial rewriter on every chapter in the book. I know where we left things out and why, where we put things in that didn't belong and why, where we uh, made compromises that were um, uh, undesirable. Um, and so I'm going to talk about the problems with constructing world history as a narrative. The third level is going to take place in sections in this class. Undergraduates will be 
uh, offered a choice of four sections, uh, starting on uh, the, the section times and places will be handed out on Thursday, and the first sections will be held next week. And the sections will discuss the material, uh, generally speaking, the material in the chapter from the week before. Uh, graduate students will be in a section um, uh, with me uh, that will meet on Thursday from 10 to 10.50, uh, tentatively in my office in upstairs in room 421, depending on how many graduate students uh, there are. Uh, the TAs uh, will, uh, will talk not only about what's been in the material for in the textbook for the week and perhaps give their version of what was wrong with the lectures, but uh, they will also talk about and ask you to discuss ancillary readings, of which there won't be a lot, but also material contained on a website called Bridging World History. This was a very large and expensive project by the Annenberg Foundation that produced um, units covering themes of world history. And certain themes, these are videos plus transcripts plus uh, uh, visual uh, materials and so forth. Uh, and certain uh, units will be matched with specific chapters and specific weeks. Um, and you'll be expected to look at them and be able to uh, to, to talk about them. It is not inconceivable that for a paper or an examination that one would use uh, you know, or involve one of the units from Bridging World History that is not assigned in the course. This is not simply a matter to try and produce history light. It is also an effort to, uh, to uh, come to, uh, to grips with the fact that we are rapidly moving into an, a teaching environment at all levels in which written materials uh, have no intrinsic uh, priority over uh, materials in some, other, uh, in some other medium. What is distinctive about the bridging world history is that the, unlike the narrative, uh, which is uh, diachronic, uh, that is to say, it moves along progressively in time. Uh, the, uh, the units in bridging world history are thematic, and they will compare things from different periods and different parts of the world according to a certain theme, like um, oh, religious proselytization or, uh, you know, spread of uh, writing systems or something like that, there will be no expectation that you go into chronological, chronological progression. And in fact, you can look at those units in any order, uh, in any order you like. Uh, but I'm going to try and match them to specific chapters. Because this embodies one of the great uh, puzzles of the world history field. Should world history be chronological? Um, and if not, what are the alternatives? Uh, all of the books that exist uh, as narratives of world history are chronological. They start early, and they ordinarily uh, manifest a certain uh, crescendo as they get closer to, uh, to modern times. Uh, there is the conceit that history moves faster um, as you go along further in time. Uh, I don't think anybody who thinks about that really believes it. There are certainly um, uh, types of change that occur more rapidly in certain areas. 
Um, but to say that history moves faster is to imply that history is something that moves, as opposed to simply uh, the aggregate of what humans have done over some thousands or tens of thousands of years to the degree that these can be recovered uh, from surviving materials. Um, but nevertheless, uh, the textbooks tend to move uh, in a crescendo fashion. So the AP course usually requires that the second semester start in 1500 AD, while the first, se first semester starts in about 8000 BC. So we have 9,500 years uh, for one semester, followed by a semester with 500 years. Um, there's a problem. You know, is there any reason uh, why that should be? Now, in addition to the theory that history moves faster, you have people who will look at hi and say history is proportional to the number of humans living and the population uh, increases since 1500 have been so gargantuan compared with the slow growth of population prior to that time that you can justify it on that basis. Uh, because if it is the aggregate of human experiences, there are more humans who have experiences uh, that can be aggregated. So you can make excuses for, for this uh, chronological crescendo. Um, and yet the tendency is to, uh, to, on the one hand, minimize what happened before 1500, uh, and on the other hand, to give the historians who focus on the pre-1500 period a chance to wield their brush very broadly while the ones after 1500 are expected to actually pay closer attention to facts. Um, now, there are certain people who are, who have become famous as world historians, like Oswald Spengler or uh, Arnold Toynbee in the 20th century, H.G. Wells. Um, you go back farther, you get uh, Hegel. Um, back farther, you get Ibn Khaldun. Um, but the history books that we have now really don't come from that, uh, fr from that uh, intellectual line. As I say, they have come up from, uh, from more practical considerations in the K-12 system. So let's go to this, this issue of how do you provincialize Europe? Uh, it isn't simply a matter of saying less about Europe, although that's certainly part of it. It's also a matter of, of asking a question, is Europe special in any way other than the fact that we know a lot about it? In other words, is the narrative of Europe uh, absolutely distinctive, uh, or is it simply the one we know best? Uh, certainly in the post-World War II period, we had a kind of climax of, of several centuries of, of world, um, of European triumphalism, that Europe and its American, uh, you know, sidekick, uh, they now ruled the entire world, and they believed very firmly, particularly in the United States, particularly in the 1960s, that the entire world was destined to become like America uh, in a process known as modernization. Modernization theory became the technique for approaching non-European parts of the world, or non-Western parts, as they were called. Uh, why the word West is used is you know, why anyone would say Europe is Western civilization when we are so far west of Europe. Why don't we say America is Western civilization and Europe is Eastern, you know, Oriental. Um, but we don't. Um, so uh, the the modernization theory uh, was climaxing 
in the decade when the European empires were collapsing and uh, by the 1980s um, it became clear to pretty much everyone that somehow the model of Europe as being the exemplar of where the whole world was going to go was not quite working out. Um, and now you have people who are saying, suggesting that maybe China is the exemplar of where the whole world will go. Uh, just as in the 1970s you had some people who were saying that Japan might be ex the exemplar of where the world will go. Maybe we will still reach the point where we can say that Iran is the exemplar of where the world will go, my favorite. Um, but the thing is, there is no reason for all the world to go to one, in, to one place. And this is one of the things that, uh, that gets troublesome in world history. Do you look at the world as converging? Uh, and here the current word globalization uh, embodies this notion that there's a convergence. Or, you to say, or do you say that there has always been a shifting pattern of dominance and a uh, ever refreshing current of diversity and that it's never going to come together. It's fundamentally a philosophical issue uh, or an economic one, uh, whatever the distinction is between those. The, um, if you try to look at it more broadly, one way of doing it is to say that uh, are there common denominators I'll put it differently. I would say there are common denominators. There are aspects of human experience and behavior that are common to every society at every period of history in every part of the world. And if you focus on common denominators, you cannot uh, end up with a centrism because those uh, those currents, those forces, those uh, manifestations of the human experience will, uh, will still be there. So what would common denominators be? Uh, the ones that are built into this book that you'll see are uh, two, one of, or to some degree two, to some degree four. One of them is called environment and technology. Every human society has uh, seen human groups coping with environmental uh, problems or opportunities and uh, deploying, inventing and deploying or discovering technologies to make this possible. So uh, one of the themes we have is E and T, environment and technology. Another one we have is called diversity and dominance. It was originally called dominance and diversity, and then it was felt that that was a little too heavy-handed, so we switched it around to diversity and dominance. And said that all societies have some pattern of um, ranking or domination, um, but the, you never have total uniformity. You always have diversity manifested in one way or another. Now, the reason for these themes, um, this was uh, inside the, the first world history book that, that adopted a thematic approach. And this has made us the target of numerous other uh, heavily armed textbook writing teams that are trying to, uh, to destroy Bullet. Um, they haven't succeeded yet. But, uh, but themes prove to be a, um, a fairly viable approach, as opposed, for example, to an opposing version which uh, relates to convergence, which is contact, where you say world history is the story of when societies come into contact. So, uh, so it's a story of travelers and traders, conquerors and um, explorers. Yeah, but that gets pretty boring. Um, and the complaint by most historians was that why should we only look at Marco Polo and leave out the rest of the Renaissance. Um, you know, why is it that only the traveler and the trader and the explorer, and so forth, wh why do they get special mention? So the contact approach, which is favored by some of my um, 
colleagues in the world history field, uh, notably Ross Dunn out in San Diego, I don't think has been as uh, successful as the thematic approach. But the thing is, there are common denominators that don't lend themselves to, uh, to writing. For example, you can say um, spirituality is a common denominator. Human groups, as far as we can tell, have some orientation toward, uh, toward spirituality. The problem is that they are very inconsistent in their uh, uh, preservation of evidence about that. And the same thing would be true of, let's say, rhythm. You know, uh, humans understand the beat, well, I know some who don't, but, um, you know, but, and the rhythms differ, but we don't have any, any data that are going to, to give us this. Uh, you talk to dance historians, and they're incredibly frustrated in trying to push the history of dance back. They can see the history of dance uh, at, 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 the, at the upper end, you know, what, what survives now. But knowing where it was 500 years ago is extremely difficult uh, to do. Um, art history. Art history is a little bit better. Uh, but again, it depends upon the, uh, what things have, been, have survived, what materials they were um, they dealt with, and so forth. Uh, Audiovisual resources like those in Bridging World History to some degree permit a, um, an expansion of the sorts of common denominators that uh, that you know, I think are um, make it possible to compare societies across time and space. The particular common denominator that I have uh, developed as uh, my um, hobby horse has been relations with animals. Human societies always have some sort of attitude toward the natural world, and particularly the world of animals. Presumably, they have attitudes toward plants as well. You know, they, yeah, but what can you say about that? Uh, so I have written a book entitled Hunters, Herders, and Hamburgers. It was the product of a course I taught here for many years entitled uh, Domestic Animals in Human History. Uh, it was a book that was intended to transform animal history with brilliant new theses. It was a total failure, um, uh, partly because um, while I described the existence of the animal rights movement, I did not endorse it. So the animal rights people said, well, if you're not out there you know, freeing minks, why write about animals at all? So, um, so the book is there, and I'm actually, that'll be the first reading that I'll ask you to do. Uh, which is a segment from uh, several chapters from Hunters, Herders, and Hamburgers that will be available on CourseWorks. Is it available now? It's available now. And it has to do with, um, with the beginnings of, of domestication. How did domestic animals come into being? There is a, uh, an enormous uh, literature in this subject in which there is great um, controversy and very little agreement, um, which is to say there are lots of people who disagree with me, which is a fault, but what can I do? Um, so that, you know, animals will come up again and again in this course. Um, technology will come up again and again because I've taught history of technology here. So to some degree the lectures will be, uh, will lean toward the things that I know most about. Now let me uh, move to a substantive question. It has to do with where does it start? The, you know, because we have a word, prehistory, we have a philosophical presumption that history starts. Otherwise, we couldn't have something that comes before it. Um, 
the problem with this is that when the word prehistory uh, gained uh, circulation, the history profession seemed to believe fairly uniformly that history depended upon written records, and that therefore prehistory was what happened before you had written records. Uh, there isn't anyone in the historical profession today that would really um, maintain this definition uh, against all comers. Uh, partly because of the amazing uh, discoveries made by archaeologists, uh, partly because of uh, increased scientific ability to analyze uh, material remains, uh, and partly because uh, Africa and Latin America, or pre-Columbian America, don't have anything like a trove of early written materials, uh, and yet you, you, know, you can't leave them out. Um, and therefore, how do, you do, how do you do that history? So, uh, so the question of where history starts uh, begins to be debated. There, let's say the, 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 the classic starting point was uh, the first civilizations. Uh, supposed to be in river valleys in the Middle East. It's probably not true. But uh, this is where it started because that's where we get the first written materials, Mesopotamia and Egypt. Well, maybe not, but that's where it appeared that we got the first written materials. Uh, then we move toward the idea of, well, maybe it's the Neolithic Revolution and the beginning of domesticated plants and animals. That's a starting point which in the Middle East is around 8,000 BC. The problem is that you can have domesticated plants without domesticated animals, domesticated animals without domesticated plants, and there is very, very little relationship between the processes that seem to lead to the domestication of plants, the processes that contribute to the domestication of animals. But they're, they're lumped together in this thing, and we call it the Neolithic Revolution, which technically is, dis is defined as uh, pre-metallic archaeological sites that have hundreds and thousands of itty-bitty chips of flint. And the, the flint uh, or other stone uh, was set in a sickle, so you would have a piece of wood shaped roughly like that. And then you would embed in it these sharp stone chips. And you would use this sawtooth-like device to cut grass. You would go into a field of wild wheat or wild barley, put your arm around a whole bunch of stalks, and you'd saw through them. And the, uh, the residue of the grass can be found uh, on the chips that survive today. We know that this was done. Um, so we say, OK, well, th this is Neolithic. We, we know that we can attach these little bits of stone to the growing of, of grasses uh, that become domestic. What this has to do with animals is you know, is purely conjectural. Because there was a theory that is still hotly debated that the domestication of animals depends upon sedentary life. Because the animals have to be kept in a pen. And how are you going to pen up the animals if you're traveling around every night? So if you have to have sedentary life, then you have to have something you're living on. Therefore, you have to have something like domesticated plants. This was a, this notion of penning up the animals to uh, begin a process of domestication, and I'll go into this in more detail uh, on Thursday. Um, uh, this was a uh, successor theory to the theory that hunters 
became herders. Uh, so that people, let's say in Central Asia, for, say from the Mesolithic on, they hunted horses and ate them. And then just about the time some people somewhere else were planting wheat and barley, they said, let's stop hunting the horses and let's start herding them instead. And voila, domestic horses. Uh, they simply evolved. And then you think, well, why didn't they do that 10,000 years earlier? Wasn't that a stupid thing to wait so long? They say, well, they didn't know domestication existed. Well, of course they did, because they had dogs. Um, so, well, you know, maybe they just didn't, maybe they thought about the dogs differently than the horse. It, it became very confusing. But the Neolithic Revolution becomes this hypothetical starting point. Then you have something that has arisen in the last five years or so, which is called Big History. Uh, and it's, there are books on it, and there are debates on it. And Big History says, why is it that if we've had um, hominids around for three million years, why are we only writing the history of them uh, for the last um, 10,000 years, from 8,000 BC to the present? What about those other millions, hundreds of thousands of years? Shouldn't we write that as part of our history? And so the big history, people say, let's think of all of the hominids and people, you know, uh, human-like beings that existed, and think of them all together, and then you think, and you think, and you think, and you, know, you realize that you're not going to get it anywhere, so you leave the bathroom, and you uh, go back to your office, and you try and do some real history. But the, um, the problem with big history is that it, it encourages people to really get inv involved with the science. Because this, you know, for the pre-Neolithic stuff, it's really uh, complicated science to understand uh, how to interpret the things that you're looking at, and the science changes over time. So just to take one um, small but perhaps telling example: uh, dating with carbon-14. Uh, carbon-14 is a naturally occurring isotope of carbon uh, that uh, is taken in by plants and animals and their <coughs> the carbon-oxygen cycle. And so <coughs> the percentage of carbon-14 in your body at any one moment is uh, considered to be uh, equivalent to the percentage of carbon-14 that you have in the atmosphere at large. So you get a ratio between carbon-14, which decays into carbon-12. The rate of decay is known. And therefore, when you look at uh, organic remains from long ago, and you look at the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12, uh, you can say there must have been so much carbon-14, and now it has diminished, and therefore we can measure the amount of time. So the amount of carbon-14 becomes a dating device. Uh, this was a great breakthrough in archaeology, and it proved to be only partially correct, because the assumption was that the percentage of the carbon in the atmosphere that was of the isotope carbon-14 was not a constant, but rather changes over time. And this was determined by studying the wood contained in tree rings so that every ring in a tree, the, the wood stops absorbing carbon after that season and the next ring out, the next ring out. And so you could look at a sequence of carbon-14 in tree rings. And by matching tree ring thicknesses, um, you could push 
back thousands of years. And so you came up with something called corrected carbon-14 dates. The, the corrected dates tend to be much older than the straight carbon-14 dates, depending on how far, how far back you go in time. Now, this, this could have consequences. For example, if you look at carbon-14 dates and you think of Stonehenge, uh, and you say, well, you know, if you go to Greece, you take a tour and you go to Mycenae, and you go to a tomb there where you see uh, the stonework that's been done, or you go to Tiryns and you see the stonework done there, and then you look at Stonehenge, you, and you look at the carbon-14 dates, you say, well, the Greeks, who had domestic animals and wheat and barley, built in big stones. And somewhat later, you had big stones showing up in France and Scotland and England. So the Greeks must have come and taught the people to schlep big stones around. Why they would have done this uh, is unclear, except presumably that the Greeks knew that moving big stones was what civilized people did. Then corrected carbon-14 dates came in, and it turned out that Stonehenge was older than the earliest big stones in Greece. So then people had to say, well, none of us believe that the English went to Greece and taught them how to schlep big stones, because that would make no sense at all, because the Greeks are civilized and, you know, in England, they were living in caves. Um, so instead, we have to think of some way that those stones could have been moved without the assistance of some smart Greek. Now, we've known this for some time. And the issue of carbon-14 dates as opposed to corrected carbon-14 dates uh, is an important one. I'll come back to it later on when I talk about the invention of the wheel, which is a crucial uh, topic that I will uh, bore you with at some length. But it turns out that now, we look further at carbon-14, and we find you know there are sites where the carbon-14 level in animal bones is different from the carbon-14 level in human bones. As if you had 300-year-old people who were herding six-month-old sheep. You know, it didn't make much sense. Why would you have a difference in the bones? And the answer to that turns out uh, so far as I can read, I'm not a chemist, um, to have to do with the issue of nitrogen-15. Who knew? The nitrogen-15 um, uh, is conveyed into human skeletal remains by the consumption of fish, because fish uh, you know, have a high levels of nitrogen-15 that correlates with uh, different levels of carbon-14. So if you can compare the two, you can say, here are the animal bones. Let's call those hard carbon-14 dates. And here are the human bones. And the human bones have slightly different ones. So what can we infer? We can infer from this the percentage of the diet dependent on fish. And this is, is sort of a revelation, because fish bones do not preserve archaeologically unless big, big fish, you know. But ordinarily, fish bones don't show up very much. But it turns out that there are societies, such as um, around the big rivers flowing into the Black Sea, the, uh, the Danube, the Dniester, the Dnieper, the Don, the Boog, um, where in the early days of human settled society, 50% of the animal protein was coming from fish, not from hunting. The other 50% came from hunting. There were no domestic animals. Um, and of course, it applies to the Pacific Northwest, where you had huge, elaborate communities with possessions and uh, ranks of society and so forth, but no farming but lots of fish, 
I mean, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Gallery, uh, to, to, to the Galaxy was right on about thank you for all the fish because um, fish are terribly important. So then you go back to the question of Egypt and Mesopotamia, these early river valleys. Were they the centers of civilization because that is where wheat and barley are grown, as we know because of the remains of these Neolithic sickles? Or are they the centers of civilization? Because that's where the fish were. Well, of course, at the time people were doing their archaeological studies of Egypt and Mesopotamia, they didn't know anything about nitrogen 15. And so going back and now trying to decide um, what sort of role fish played uh, hasn't yet been done. But of course, it leads to, to the possibility that you say that uh, settled society does not, may not depend upon uh, domesticated plants, but may depend upon abundance of fish. So communities by lakes, communities along seashores where you often have uh, whole acres covered with seashells from uh, edible um, mollusks, um, rivers, uh, you might even say that areas that have the fewest opportunities to get fish, that is to say deserts with rivers running through them, are more likely to have dense human settlement in those valleys than areas like Central Africa where there are fish flopping about all over the place from myriad rivers and streams and so forth because they get you know 30 plus inches of rain per year and the Middle East gets, in most of it, less than eight inches of rain per year. So, you know, what we've written in our narrative assumes that grain farming is the key. And yet it may, it may not be the key. And indeed, farming may not be the key. And this leads to something that I have been perplexed by all summer long when I was supposed to be writing a book. And this is the problem of the, the grand narrative we have, that by growing wheat and barley, fields of grain, we could have a, a more dense population because the calories per acre were greater if you grew grain uh, than if you were simply a forager. The broad estimate uh, that is used is that foragers require about one square mile per year to support a single person. So a foraging band of 50 to 75 people, you can imagine living somewhere within a circle with a radius of about five miles. And that would be, you know, between 75 and 80 square miles, and that would sustain that band for the year, and the next band of 50 75 people would be at least 10 miles away, and therefore you don't have density of, of settlement, you just have small dispersed bands. But if you had wheat and barley, then you can have dense settlement, and then the theory is that we have in this book and in all the other books, that once you have dense settlement, then you have division of labor, uh, then you have social classes, you have trade, you have cities, you have gods, you have warfare, and you have civilization. All because you can have this density of, of population if you have wheat and barley. But wheat and barley are not really all that big in producing calories per acre. Uh, potatoes produce way more calories per acre than wheat and barley. Uh, so do yams. So do sweet potatoes, so does manioc, um, uh, so does rice, so do apples. Uh, wheat and barley, you know, they're, they're grass seed. Uh, they don't, you know, they're, they're edible, but, but they're not really, you know, even corn produces a lot more. I mean, you sort of wonder if, could wheat have been grown and trained to become like corn to be giant so you 
just have an ear of wheat and eat it. We never tried it. But, but then the result is that if all of these other plants that are domestic and are grown in other parts of the world other than the river valleys of the Middle East, if they produce not only more calories per acre than wild plants, but they produce more calories per acre than wheat and barley and other grains, then why didn't civilization grow where those plants were? Why didn't these things that we associate with density of population and settlement arise in Central Africa or northern Brazil or um, places that where you had uh, these other plants growing? No one can answer that. They can't answer it because these other plants don't, so far, uh, leave uh, archaeological remains. Whereas the straw that is used for that wheat and barley grow on uh, comes to be used as a strengthening uh, item in early pottery. And you can identify wheat and barley straw in uh, places where you've had uh, burning, the carbonization of the, um, of the kernels will allow you to identify grains. But no one has a way of identifying the earliest manioc or the earliest yams. And yet the foragers of South and Central America and Africa and Southeast Asia uh, who, are, who still live by hunting and gathering eat these things as wild plants. It isn't that the plants weren't known. So when did they become domestic? When did they start to support dense populations? Why weren't they the first? And here you get, you get mysteries. Um, like, let's take bananas. Uh, the genus of the banana, moose, um, has four species, as I recall, three of which are not edible, by humans at least. All bananas, plantains and bananas, same thing, are, uh, belong to the same species. And what is striking about bananas is that the banana has no seeds. You can take a banana and stick it in the ground and wait the rest of your life, and you will not have a banana tree growing where you put that banana in the ground. There are no seeds. Nor is there any evidence of there ever having been banana seeds. And yet the other species of that genus all have seeds. So at some point, selection of this particular edible banana plant uh, developed so specifically in relationship to human population that the only way the bananas could be spread was by humans taking cuttings from banana trees and sticking them in the ground. Uh, and they did this around the world in prehistoric times, whatever that may mean. Um, bananas produce enormous numbers of calories per acre. They we know that, they're, that they become domestic very early because they lose their seeds, but we don't know how early because we have no archaeological remains that prove that. Could you have had civilization predicated on massive eating of bananas? Well, why not? Um, you know, fried plantains are at least as good as oatmeal. Um, so, but it didn't happen. So it leads to this question of uh, historical reasoning that says, you know, uh, post hoc ergo propter hoc. You know, civilization comes in the place where you have wheat and barley cultivation, therefore it must be a result of that cultivation. Uh, we put this in the, in the world history textbook, we repeat it over and over again, and there's a strong likelihood that it is simply uh, not true. Uh, now let me say one final word going back to this question of world history 
uh, in general. Because of the, this evolution I mentioned at the beginning of class, from the K-12 educational system rising up higher and higher, spiraling toward the pinnacle of achievement and finally reaching Columbia University. Uh, as a result of this, the United States is the only place that teaches world history, at least in this, in this sort of uh, uh, decentralizing fashion. And it's becoming a peculiarity of what American historians do and something that is very questionable from other historical perspectives. Because if you, if you, as I said, if you're doing American history, what do you do for the period before 1776? You have to do something. But if you're doing English history, you have lots of history before 1776. You can just take that island and wring it out for thousands of years and have more history. Same thing with France or Slovakia or um, you know, Korea or something. Uh, it was the Americans that have found, that found it necessary to, uh, to embark on this uh, on this eccentric, this decentralizing uh, uh, program. So to the degree that world history is becoming a sort of philosophical outlook and not simply a, uh, a narrative, it's one that is going to become um, a, a proselytizing one, I think. In other words, I think Americans are going to uh, try to sell world history to the world in the years to come. And uh, when they get around to doing that, uh, my hope is that they will be writing a lot better books than uh, the one that you're going to be reading uh, this semester. And hopefully, um, better books along the ingenious lines posed by the author of the book when he's taking his own work to pieces. So. I'll see you on Thursday. How many graduate students are in the room? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven.